enterprise. Um, and, and misconduct is, is defined by, as plagiarism. What else? There's three of them. Falsification. Falsification and fabrication. So those are the th those are the three items, um, and that there's cases of whistleblowing where where people um, find something that's wrong, they think is wrong, and they see something, they say something, and we 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 discussed this little case here. And and for those of you in, in, uh, that didn't go through it last week, uh, you can you can read this little case and think about um, uh, really who who was guilty here. Uh, was it the the PI that maybe mispublished the uh, the figure, or was it the postdoc that, that made the complaint? Um, so, and, and one thing we, we uh, talked about a little bit is if you are a whistleblower, what are some of the things you have to worry about doing? And this was that little tiny slide that we uh, had last week. I made it a little bigger, but <laughs> it's also on the website if you need it. And it's basically if you see something and you need to say something, um, these are kind of the, some of the steps you want. And that is uh, consider alternative explanations. You know, maybe that person, really, um, you may be wrong. You may have misjudged what's going on in the situation. Ask questions. Don't accuse. Be aware of any documentation that supports your concerns and where it is. If it's a, if it's a, a figure, like we talked about last time, if someone uh, uh, fabricated or falsified a, uh, uh, a printout from some sort of a machine that measured something, you have the original printout. Have the the final figure that's in the, in the manuscript. If they're, if they're different, then you have evidence. Uh, separate your personal and professional feelings or problems. Uh, think about how you would, uh, think how, how would you like the problem to be resolved? Do you want the person to go to jail? <laughs> Is that what you want? Or do you just want, you want, you want the data to be good so you can publish a paper and get your, and finish your degree? I mean, what's the outcome that you want? Um, seek advice from someone you can trust and take it seriously. Uh, that is, consult someone objectively to evaluate these issues and listen to what they have to say, and then get a second opinion and take that also seriously. Uh, if you're going to file charges, you may want to make sure that you're doing the right thing, and you want to have somebody that's on your side. Um, if you decide to initiate formal proceedings, it's easier if you have that support from these folks, and if you have that support of actual physical um, uh, evidence that, that would pertain to what your claim is. Find out where to file charges and do it properly. And here at the university, it's the office of the uh, vice president for research, and uh, and you could go through uh, a dean, and and then that it'll go up to the VPR's office from there. Um, file charges objectively. You know, a, as a complainant, you need to say say uh, objectively what happened, and then um, throughout the investigation, ask questions and keep thorough notes for yourself. But stay out of it unless someone asks you to be involved. And then be patient. It takes years. It takes years and years and years to go through, go through the process. We, um, I, I talked about this ooh, video, which is now on the scan screen thing, Joe, um, <laughs> that uh, you can go log into at the Office of, of Research Integrity. And it's called The Lab. And um, for those of you, oh, good. Um, for those of you that um, may need to make up some time, that's a that, that's a good thing to to log on to and and um, uh, review. And just just sit down and, and and go through it. It's an interactive video. It's very. Has anybody done it yet? I, I know I mentioned it last week. We did. Yeah. Well, it was it was a while ago um, when you, you took us through uh, the lab series. All oh, right. Um, in a, a pub ad class. Oh, okay. Three years ago. Okay. Yeah, and it's basically the same. And and you could just you can just Google ORI the lab and, and it'll come up. But that's the Office of Research Integrity. I'll just write that here. Office of Research Integrity. And it's in the Health and Human Services part of the dot G O V. Okay. Uh, so so that's the whole issue of, of whistleblowing and. The lab uh, really centers on a graduate student that, that goes through the process of whistleblowing about a, a situation uh, having to do with a paper that was published and wasn't authorized. And uh, it, it's, it's actually it's very entertaining as well as it's got a lot of insight to it. And um, Joe, we can go back to the PowerPoint. Uh, the Office of Research Integrity does print out 
uh, every so often, well, it continues to add on to cases of research misconduct, and uh, those were the 2014, and here's the 2015 so far. Um, and in this, well, uh, let me back up one here. Um, in this particular case, the last one that's, that's logged in for 2015 is that the, the Office of Research Integrity found the respondent engaged in research misconduct by falsifying data. And in this publication, and it details uh, quite a bit about, yeah. The, uh, this is the, the CFR, which I showed. The only words you've got to worry about here is plagiarism, falsification, and fabrication. That's what the CFR talks about for what actual re research misconduct is. And um, we talked about last time, again, we're almost up to date here, um, about uh, actual misconduct. It used to be thought, and, and that it was only one in 10,000 or one in 100,000, and because of survey data and others, that this has been estimated closer to one in 100, uh, where people actually uh, bend the rules and aren't doing science the way they should be doing. And we talked about last time, one of the issues is this irreproducibility. Uh, this was a cancer group that got together in San Diego last year and said um, they tried to replicate um, 50 studies, so a project was undertaken by Amgen researchers to reproduce the results of 50 studies. The vast majority were not reproducible even by the original researchers. So in the, in the medical industry, that's, uh, that's huge if you're, if you're working on trying to treat, treat people and save lives, so to speak, or make progress in, uh, in cancer treatments and other things. Um, these are the, the uh, announcements of the regulation, uh, just to say that it's, it's didn't happen until 2010, and then uh, USDA came on in 2013, and there's probably a couple others down the pipe. Um, and these are the standards that we're talking about, and we've already talked about um, um, a number of things. And, we're, and for instance, mentorship, we're going to dwell on more today. We talked a little bit about it last time. Uh, we're going to talk about your experiences in talking with your mentors and such. We talked a bit about whistleblower ethics already. and. Uh, We'll, we'll cover a lot of these other areas throughout the rest of the, of, of the 10 weeks. Um, we talked about whether it's a good idea to nip it in the bud. And in other words, is if you see something, should you, should you jump on it right then and just talk right away to, the, to your coworker? And we talked about some issues, of uh, maybe power differentials. Maybe one person was the boss and the other one was, you know, was the grad student, let's say. And, and uh, or it was giving you your grade or paying your salary or, or something, and you may not feel like you can step in and say something. Um, a lot of you said, "Yeah, I, I would say something," and because that's my data. That that we're working together on this project, and that affects how I'm going to how my outcomes are going to be. And I don't want um, you know old Bob here to affect my future. So I'm going to say something. Uh, and and then there was the pie charts. I don't think I put those back on here. That um, you know more than half the people that were encountered this kind of a situation actually did say something and of that about half of the people that did say something about two-thirds of them things worked out pretty good so you have to judge whether that's going to work for you if you see something and then say it um, and then uh, to mentoring is this is where we'll sort of launch into our discussion for those of you that were able to talk to your mentor is that men um, mentoring alone may be insufficient but mentoring is essential to promote a positive attitude towards what research ethics is about, and then also it's your duty. If you're, if you're a professional, I'm trying to get off the squeaky part. If you're a professional, um, it, it, it's, it's your duty to talk, take an active role in helping to train the next generation of researchers, whether they're, again, they're in industry, or whether they're in academia, or no matter where they are. And, and uh, so how you learn those duties is, is part of all this. And then, uh, I guess finally, I think, it, yeah, it might be the last one, is uh, that both you as the trainee or mentee and your mentor or your advisor both have responsibilities to, to make this relationship work in mentoring. And that includes common things in, in communication. You need to talk to each other. And hopefully this exercise was a step in the right direction there. Uh, trust each other about, you know, giving advice and getting advice. Uh, be available and accessible. Be flexible. Um, and then as a student, develop independence. Get the heck out of there. <laughs> Don't stay around for 12 or 15 years. Unless, I mean, it's, you know, really cush. That's okay, I guess. But, uh, you know, you want to get out and get your own career running. And, and that, that helps everybody. Um, so that's where we got to pretty much last week. So let's, let's talk about the animals. Then we'll talk about the other animals, which would be people in just a minute here. 
We'll launch into this. So, um, ethical issues besides using animals and research and what you need to do. You don't go to sleep. You, this, you, this will be relevant at some point. And it's, it also, it's just really interesting. So, I'm um, talk about the IACUC, which is the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, IACUC, uh, and why there's all these animal regulations, and there's something about the three R's and why a monkey needs a lawyer. This, yeah, anybody know who this is? It's Pavlov's dog. What do you know about Pavlov's dog? This is an animal and research sort of issue here. What do you know about Pavlov's dog? The interesting thing about Pavlov is, is that he, I think he got a Nobel Prize in 1901 um, for discovering and describing uh, peptidase and some of the salivary enzymes. And, and the, the process, just to cut to the quick, the process was he, he was able to uh, pr present food, the dog would salivate, they'd collect the saliva, analyze it, figure out what it was chemically, and then he'd work down the gut all the way to the stomach, and, and he'd you know, cut here and the food would fall out here and, and they'd collect whatever came out, you know, the, the glands produced. And then he, he was able to make cuts also in, in, in some of the gastric area so that the meat would fall out before it actually filled up the stomach. He'd collect that stuff too. And, and these, these dogs, you see pictures of them and they're all, they're all sitting there, they're the kind of happy little dogs, but they have these little flaps of skin that are sewed, sewed up and, and uh, used. Um, and then, he, but then he figured out uh, peptidase in particular was uh, really good at settling the stomach, and, and he did this uh, uh, by looking at some of the actions of, of that salivary enzyme, and came up with the whole. What peptidase sound like and upset stomach? What peptobismol? Peptobismol, right? He marketed little little vials of pepto. I don't know if he called it peptobismol, but later it became the pink stuff that we use to settle our stomach now. It's not the same stuff from dogs that he did, but he would mark, he'd peddle it. So he had a little warehouse of dogs lined up, and, and they'd, they'd manufacture this peptidase, and they'd market it. And so there's a use, I mean, animals and research, but then also kind of crosses the boundary in the industry, and, and there's some like, questions about regulation and, you know, these poor dogs and all that, but um, that's, that's the way animals are, are were treated for a long, long time. And... Uh, so just, this is just all you need to know. This, this, this slide is what you need to know if you do anything with animals at, at UNM, or for that uh, matter, any, any uh, university campus. Anybody that's affiliated with UNM must have an approved animal care and use protocol um, that's approved by the IACUC, and that includes using any live or vertebrate animals. It includes amphibians, birds, fish, mammals, reptiles, or vertebrate animal tissue. Doesn't include cockroaches. Doesn't include worms. Doesn't include other little things that don't have vertebra. Uh, but it does include breeding and holding, field lab or tissue protocols. The museums have a, a, pro, a protocol that is a blanket that allows them to collect animals for, for their collection. Um, there's an electronic process to submit your protocols uh, to get it uh, reviewed and approved. And um, there's trainings that go on. So you have to do some training as well to, to, to get an animal protocol. So it's anytime you use animals. They, uh, the, I guess the ontogeny or the evolution of the animal protection laws um, they included, oh, let's say in New York, 1828, they, there's an anti-cruelty law where you couldn't, your donkey couldn't die in a city street. Uh, you know, it wouldn't move, you couldn't beat it until it died. You, had to, you couldn't do that. Uh, then there was a 28-hour law where if you're traveling through the country with, with livestock, you had to stop every 28 hours and exercise food and water. So that was, that was again, for a animal's benefit. It was all the way up until the Nuremberg trials after World War II that said, if you're going to do work on human subjects, you need to do it on animals first. So that was really the first time that, that, um, that researchers started using animal models in a, in a re real regular way, or after that time. Um, then there, Pepper disappeared. Pepper was a, a family in Virginia, I think, the, their pet dog, and uh, it disappeared. Well, it didn't show up again until this, this Life magazine expose about um, uh, people who would steal people's pets, sell them to medical labs, and they'd be used in medical experiments. Uh, there's Pepper, poor Pepper. And that same year, um, 
Congress passed the uh, Lab Animal Welfare Act. Uh, I have uh, the guide for the care and use of lab animals, and this is the guide in, in 2011, and, and it's been updated a number of times um, to uh, mostly for caging and requirements and food and care and things like that. Some things here in the guide, it, how it defines animals. Does not, an animal is not a, a, a member of the genus ratus, mus, or birds that are raised for research. So rats and mice, you know, lab rats and mice, are not considered animals according to the Animal Welfare Act. They are covered, however, under other regulations under the USDA. <clears throat> um, so it regulates the facilities, the operations, and it sets up uh, the IACUC and, and how the IACUC is supposed to administer it. There's some other guidances that, you know, just to, there's this Office of Lab Animal Welfare, kind of like the Office of Research Integrity in Health and Human Services, the Office of Lab Animal Welfare um, oversees the, the, through the Public Health Service the, 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 on how animals are cared and used in research. The IACUC, which is a committee, it has uh, a chair, has a veterinarian, so we have a veterinarian here on campus. There's uh, scientific and non-scientific members and non-affiliated members. What's a non-affiliated member? What's that mean? Somebody that's not tied to that research. Or not even tied to UNM. So someone outside of UNM. So a non-scientific might be someone that's right not a scientist but still serves to uh, um, uh, employ the university. That rev reviews and approves these protocols. Facilities are inspected every six months. They investigate any claims of, of um, well, any claims that have to do with animal uh, welfare, and then there's all the compliance to, uh, to the guidelines. The main concerns of the IACUC is, is animals' uh, pain and distress, and that's any study that, that has to do with pain and distress. And then there's these, these pain and distress categories. Um, I don't know why there's no category A, but category B is just uh, breeding and holding, and then C are procedures that have no pain, um, and then there's kind of a line here. Then there's category D and E, which have some sort of procedures that involve pain and distress, or, or no more than minimal pain and distress, or momentary pain and distress, I guess, um, and, uh, but have, have anesthetics or analgesics involved. And then category E, it's unalleviated. It's a, a, a procedure that might involve pain and distress, but are not uh, alleviated by chemicals or drugs. Um, those are rare and have to be scientifically justified. These are fairly common. What, what do you think is an example of a no pain category C procedure? Or having uh, less than or momentary pain and distress? If you're testing toothpaste or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'd probably be a good one, yeah. A little rodent. Um, yeah, or, or a behavioral stuff or observing things. That, that, uh, I mean, you can maybe do water maze, I suppose, or something that amazes that they have um, rewards and such. Um, actually, euthanasia is also a category C. So actually, uh, what's euthanasia? It's killing something of the animal. Yeah, you know, a, a humane, uh, a painless death. So if you kill them quick, then it's less than momentary pain and distress. Um, and then th these are survival surgeries usually. Um, and then these, again, um, would be things like um, uh, 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 learned helplessness. You've maybe heard of some psychology uh, trials where they'll have an electrified grid in a cage and the little mouse will, it's a mild, mild shock, but it, it's a shock just the same, and the mouse will try to escape, but it can't escape, and it'll just eventually just sit there and take the, the shock, and that's called a learned helplessness model. There's not, a, again, it's, that's, they're fairly rare, but that's an example. Um, then there's the three R's, reduce, refine, replace, not reuse, recycle, and whatever. It's uh, reducing the number of animals used, uh, refinements, techniques that, that reduce pain and distress, and then replace, use lower sentient animals. Like what? So if you're going to do a study on, I don't know, sleep deprivation or something like that, and, and, and um, you, you want to... You want to be able to know how it works on humans. If you, you know, turn the light on every five minutes, wake them up, and you take some brain chemical, some blood reading, and let them go to sleep, and then turn the light back on, wake them up. Um, <laughs> that could be considered cruel, I suppose. Um, but would you do that on 
on chimps? Would you do it on cats? Would you do it on ducks? Would you do it on fish? That's done on soldiers all the time. <laughs> that's right. It's, oh, I, yeah, that's, I guess so. I forgot about that part. Um, so, so you ought to, you ought to suggest to your CEO that you, you that they do it on fish. That'd be a less sentient, sentient being. So the whole idea is, is that uh, um, lower on the phylogenetic scale, so there's a lower sentience. That's funny. Okay, um, and then you do these online protocols. Uh, this is something I want you to think about. Recently, uh, as recent as April, last April. Um, there's these two monkeys, two chimps at Stony Brook, Leo and Hercules, that um, were actually uh, at one point given habeas corpus. In other words, their day in court because they, they, quote, wanted to be released from, from this um, animal, animal facility. Now, how they wanted to be released is they were represented by this group called, it's here somewhere. Um, yes, where is that? Yeah. The, Third line down. Oh, okay, good. Uh, the Non-Human Rights Project. And um, so the, the judge said, yeah, they get their day in court. Then quickly, like, like 24 hours later, they said, no, no, no. No, we, no they don't really get habeas corpus. Uh, uh, but um, we're still going to hear the case. And it went on from April to May until finally last week or something. There's the Non-Human Human Rights Project. Uh, you can go listen about Hercules. He's quite the chimp. Uh, <laughs> July, end of July, last month, the New York judge denied the request to extend, a, extend legal rights to the two chimps. So in a case watched by animal rights activists and courtroom curiosity seekers, the state Supreme Court judge in Manhattan on Thursday denied a request to free a pair of chimps, uh, Hercules and Leo, um, that are being held at a state university uh, that sought a writ of habeas corpus, an age-old method of challenging unlawful imprisonment, was the latest attempt, attempt by a nonprofit uh, non human rights project to establish apes as legal persons. The group argues that chimps are self aware and autonomous. A contention is supported by submitting affidavits attesting the animal's intelligence, language skills, and personalities, among other traits, in several cases filed in New York on behalf of the various imprisoned primates. Um, so, I guess the, the, the. Well, I don't know. What do you think? There is no point. What do you think? <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> that's true. If corporations are people, I guess so are chimps. So, so where's the line? Where's the line between, um, or I guess, of autonomy, or, or, so when they say they submitted affidavits attesting to the intelligence or language skills and personalities. I mean, my I have a new nine-week-old puppy now. And that dog, I mean, that thing's got personality. Dogs are really intelligent. Yeah. So what, could I claim that, I mean, that, that's a being that has autonomy and has rights? And I, w I wouldn't recognize, I'd recommend making them a dependent on your taxes. <laughs> no. That's right. It doesn't work at no. all. No. <laughs> no I, right. I won't do that. I won't do that. I, I just wanted to know how far you could possibly take this. And, and, um, I mean, it's gone from, you know, the New York law where you can't beat your donkey uh, to death in the middle of the street. Animals are property. At least that's, that's, been, the, that's been the rule. To, to Hercules. Or dolphins. Or, I don't know, squid. They're pretty smart, actually. Octopi. Anyway, I just put that out there. Well, that's one of the issues between admiralty law and a constitutional law of the land. Ah, ah. Under admiralty law, which is what pretty much most of the planet is under, everything is property, everything can be annotated on a spreadsheet by an accountant. I gotta put you back on the screen here. There you are. Um, well, you're on my screen, you're not on the big screen. Oh yeah, there you are. Um, admiralty, oh okay. So. And the and the, 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 the opposite or the the uh, domestic law. How, what did you refer that to that as? Uh, the law of the land, which is the U.S. Constitution, it limits what legal fictions can do. Governments, corporations, everything else. 
uh, because under the common law, the law of the land, everyone was simply expected to have a minimum respect for the land around. Our nation was founded on Christian principles as contained in the Bible, and one of which is respect of nature because that is God's creation. Ah, okay. Now under admiralty law, which is also known as contract law, everything comes down to money and everything is property, including all of us. Ooh. Okay. All right. Um, any any questions about using animals in research? And we'll do the last chunk Ooh, in 10 minutes um, on human subjects. If I can get over to you. Wait. Okay, human subjects and the uh, um, how how use of humans in research is used is very similar to how we view ha uh, animals in research in lots of ways. There's a, an institutional review board instead of the uh, the IACUC. This is the IRB, and um, see, it's a really easy process to navigate to get through. <laughs> There's all sorts of rules and regulations, basically, and then. Then it says, uh, grind through IRB review, and then it says, approved, hopefully, and then it says, start again, <laughs> which is basically true. I cooks, uh, uh, the animal protocols are, are good for three years if they're approved. Um, IRB uh, are good for one year at most, and then you have to get another approval done. So, as you know, and, and you, if you use humans in research in any sorts of way, actually, that's a prairie dog, so that doesn't count. But whether they're little blue pills or blue fluid or some guy with wires on his head or you're asking somebody an opinion about anything um, or you're looking at other cultures um, or oral histories, all that falls under some sort of um, institutional review board review. And what they, uh, the, the questions that they'll ask, the IRB will ask is, is it research? Is it a human subject? And if you, if you fall under those two defini those definitions, those are the the um, IRB definitions, um, then you have to submit a protocol for review and approval. Uh, and what the IRB committee does is they look at the benefit and the risk, as defined there, um, to, 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 I guess, categorize your, your protocol, but then also to, before it's approved. There's a couple of events that led up to um, an ethics code for using humans in, in research. All these you've heard of before, I'm sure. Uh, Nuremberg trials after World War II, um, and there's some history before this, uh, um, before Nuremberg actually about humans and, 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 and others, but um, there's 10 points. Voluntary consent is essential of the human subject. Experimentation should have some results that benefit society. Experiment should be based on animals again. This is where this came up from. Um, Experiments should be conducted to avoid all, all unnecessary physical and mental suffering. Uh, you shouldn't expect to die if you take part in a human subject's research. The degree of risk it shouldn't exceed, again, what the benefit is, is supposed to be. Uh, there must be proper facilities and preparations, and it should be conducted by someone that's qualified to do the work. Um, the experiment, um, the person should be at liberty to stop their involvement at any time or stop the experiment at any time. And then the scientists in charge must also be um, willing to stop. Tuskegee um, is probably the, the, the most notable. It's where um, uh, almost 400 African-American males that had syphilis were in, enrolled in a study. They were given, quote, free medical exams but never told about their disease. This went on for 40 years and, and they weren't treated for syphilis even after penicillin, which, which did treat syphilis became available in the 50s. Penicillin was actually around the late 30s, early 40s, but only was, was provided to the military. Uh, and then many of the participants did die of the syphilis. The study was stopped in 1972. Actually, it was after a, a, an article in Rolling Stone that came out um, that detailed it. Uh, Milgram, Stanley Milgram experiment. Uh, this is where you had this little box that had lots of little levers that, that, that delivered a voltage there's Stanley right there in front of his little box. And um, <clears throat> the, it was uh, basically, here's the participant called the teacher in front of his, the, the little box, the levers. 
experimenter, uh, some guy in a white lab coat. And then behind a curtain, there was a student that was supposedly wired to the, to the box. Uh, there was a, it was actually a fake shock machine with a teacher, student, and experimenter. The participant was told to teach a student to memorize the words. If they didn't do it right, they got punished by a shock. Uh, the, they had 30 levers, each one an additional 15 volts. With each mistake, the, the teacher pulled the lever and, and thought that they were shocking the student. Um, the teacher was led to believe that he or she was, was shocking the student who screamed and asked to leave at higher voltages and eventually fell silent. It was just a recorded track. Uh, if the teacher questioned, this is from a, a quote from a book, if the teacher questioned continuing as instructed, the experimenter simply said, the experiment requires that you go on. Um, and then the, the quote is, what the experiment shows is that the person whose authority I consider to be legitimate has a right to tell me uh, what to do, and therefore I have an obligation to follow the orders. That person can make me, make mo most people act contrary to their conscience. So uh, that was a Milgram experiment in a nutshell. And then the last I wanted to go over is the Stanford Prison Experiments, where in the basement of the psychology building, uh, this, the investigator, Zimbardo, um, held, had 24 college students, very similar building as our psychology building over here. And um, half of them were prison guards, half of them were, were prisoners. And in a very short period of time, a day or two, uh, it, it got very, it got very uh, extreme where the guards really took on sort of bullying um, the prisoners and the, and the prisoners actually felt quite, quite vulnerable. Um, it says, in his role as prison administrator, Zimbardo became so engrossed in the jail system that he didn't stop the experiment as soon as cruelty began. He said, if I were simply the experimenter, I would have ended it after the second kid broke down. We all did bad things, including me. But that's diagnostic of the power situation. You can read that in the paper, I suppose. Um, it said our planned two-week investigation was stopped after only six days. Um, and as it turned out, uh, uh, I saw about a couple, two years ago now, um, is Where Are They Now? Stanford Alumni Magazine had this guy on the cover. And, you know, 40 years, where are they now? And, and uh, the woman who was the, in charge of the pro sort of project administrator, she's the one that said, hey, uh, Zimbardo, we need to stop this. He, this is getting out of hand. These kids are going, going bonkers. Um, they ended up getting married, as it turned out. So they're now husband and wife, Zimbardo and his, his, his lab uh, coordinator. Um, but they also followed the lives of these people 40 years. You know, one guy is up in Idaho, in northern Idaho, and he gets up in the morning, does perimeter with his weapons, you know, just to, uh, of his, th you know, three or four acre property. And, you know, and, and another one's been divorced and married about a bunch of, bunch of times. And anyway, it, it, I mean, it was very dramatic. And, and uh, what happened to these people? One thing that's interesting is that both Zimbardo and uh, Milgram were in, went to high school together. <laughs> really? Um, so these, these studies, but mostly um, the Tuskegee syphilis study, uh, drove the uh, government to form a, a, a commission to investigate how human subjects are used in biomedical and behavioral research. And it led to uh, what's called the Belmont Report. It's got a lot longer name in that, but, um, and it has three ethical principles that it, it's driven by. Oh, time to stop, we're almost done. Um, respect for persons or autonomy, so treat people uh, as autonomous, autonomous agents that can make their own decisions. Beneficence, do no harm, this whole idea of, of um, benefit uh, to harm. And then justice, where um, don't use populations out of convenience. Uh, and, and then there's, there's certain safeguards that have to do with justice. No problem. So it's, it's overseen again by OHRP, which is, uh, there's a bunch of regulations. The board reviews it. There's risks. There's consent. And we'll just stop at that, uh, that point. All right. All right, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, both near and far. Uh, see you next week. Same time, same place. <laughs>